wanted to thank all of you for taking the time out of your Friday evenings to spend it with the Berkeley Forum. And before we begin, I'd just like to remind everyone to please silence your cell phones and close all laptops. Just as an introduction, the Berkeley Forum is a nonpartisan student-run organization that hosts talks, debates, and panels for the Berkeley campus and community. And everything that you see here from marketing to photography to student moderation is entirely student-run. And tonight, we're really honored to be hosting Professor Michelle Lamont. Professor Lamont is the Professor of Sociology and African and African American Studies and is the Robert I. Goldman Professor of European Studies at Harvard University. And from 2016 to 2017, she served as the 108th President of the American Sociological Association. And from 2006 to 2009, she chaired the Council for European Studies. And in 2017, she was the recipient of the Erasmus Prize for her contributions to social sciences in Europe. Professor Lamont has made numerous contributions and additions to the field of sociology, culture, and inequality. We're really honored to have her tonight. So please welcome uh, Professor Lamont to the stage. <laughs> It's a real pleasure to be here. As I mentioned to some of you, I have a daughter who graduated from here last year, comparative politics major. She lived in Sherman, so it's very bizarre to be here without her, but it's nice to see you. I think of you as her peers, so it's great. So, and I'm doubly happy to be here because the talk I'm gonna present is basically about the challenges that your generation is encountering in this moment in American history of uh, at a point in time when although many people are still embracing the American dream, you have this context of extreme inequality and uh, I will argue that we need to come up with new repertoires of hope, new narratives of hope for your generation. So the paper I'm going to present, I'm not really going to present it, I'm really going to race through it because I was told I should talk between 20 and 40 minutes, and I'd rather have more time to talk with you and converse than you give. I gave the same talk yesterday to the sociology department at, the, uh, at Stanford, and uh, you know, I don't think you need to hear all of this, but you will get the gist of the argument. So it's a talk that really, if you think about uh, after Trump's election, there's a number of very important books that were written uh, to help us make sense of the situation. One of the books that I liked most is titled How Democracy Dies by Ziblatt and Levitsky. And uh, it's a book, those two guys are experts of authoritarianism in Latin America and Europe. And they used it to try to discern what are the symptoms that we know that dem democracy is being threatened, authoritarianism is rising. It's an excellent example of how the tools of political science have been mobilized to help citizens make sense of what's happening. And I have been thinking it's very important that sociologists do the same thing, put out there a book that should be very easy to read, that you know the world can read to help us make sense. So this is a book, it's the first time that I decide to write a trade book. And it's a book that will be auctioned in two weeks at the Frankfurt School. Uh, sorry, Frankfurt Book Fair, which is a thing that happened once a year. So you can also get a preview of an argument. From a scholarly perspective, it's a book that, uh, draw, it's a, that will draw on my presidential address, which I delivered at the ASA two years ago. You have the reference here if you want to see it. In fact, it develops an argument about from two different papers. And the goal is really to think about you know, if we think about the sociology of inequality, a lot of it is about distribution uh, of resources, and I've been arguing that at least half of inequality has to do with inclusion. So we need to figure out how to uh, extend cultural membership to the widest number, i.e. how to make a larger percentage of the population feel that they are worthy and that they, have, they are fully valued as members of society. So a lot of what I'm talking to you about is about how to achieve that. And because I'm a cultural sociologist, I'm interested in how can we engineer, how can we think very systematically about institutionalizing new frameworks through which to think about people's worth. And the current problems with the American dream, which is basically that 
the values and the lifestyle of the upper middle class get to be presented to the population at large, while in fact, as a model to follow, while in fact, fewer and fewer people are actually able to reach that, even if many people think they are. So the talk really has two parts. The first one is a diagnosis. And here I tie this to the study of neoliberalism. I'll explain to you what I mean by this. And the, this phenomenon where the boundaries between group, ethno-racial groups, uh, uh, racial groups, uh, you know, anti-black boundaries, boundaries toward the poor, boundaries toward immigrants, and even very recently with Trump coming to power, boundaries toward LBGTQ are becoming more uh, rigid. So we need to think about how to transform these things. and. I'll come up with, uh, I'll propose several solutions. So the first part of the talk is a diagnosis, which has to do with the spread of neoliberalism and partly with the scripts of the self. So what are this? What is neoliberalism? You probably know what uh, it is a little bit. It is uh, the organization of society that's organized around the maximization of profit. <clears throat> it has been associated with you know, Trump but uh, in, in the early 80s, uh, Ronald Reagan comes to power, Margaret Thatcher comes to power, and um, uh, society gets reorganized in such ways that profit maximization uh, becomes uh, you know, favored, and it has many uh, impact, you know, consequences that I'm going to be discussing. But let's first talk, start with this concept of social resilience. This is a book that I, you will see throughout the talk. I'm going to use various publications to illustrate aspects of uh, what I'm talking about. So social resilience is the capacity of group enabled by institutions and by cultural repertoire to become all they can be. So an example would be uh, when the 32 states pass same-sex marriage laws, you have a very rapid decline in the number of attempted suicide among LGBTQ youths in high schools. So this is an example where these laws were not passed with the, group, the goal of reducing you know, suicide among, but it sends implicit messages that LGBTQ people are part of mainstream society and it has this immediate effect. So in this case, institutions, the law, are serving as a scaffolding or as a resource to give a sense of legitimacy to people. It influences how they think of their identity in the context of society at large. So hope is a part of the story here, and because hope is a rope, it feeds aspirations. Come on, people, come in. So especially when it is intersubjectively shared. So there's a research from Catherine Panther Briggs who is a medical anthropologist who spent a lot of time in the refugee camps of Lebanon in, in uh, uh, Turkey, studying uh, what's the difference between the kids who prosper and those who don't. And she finds that one of the big differences is whether children are able to share narratives about the future with uh, significant others, with adults. And this capacity to share makes their views of the future be seem real. And this is, has a huge impact on whether or not they're able to prosper in this environment that is very difficult. So this tells you about the importance of narratives. How we understand the present gives us template about how to project ourselves into the future and gives us the tools we need to do well, okay? So this is not only about money, it's really about how we imagine social life. It's about how you know, shared understanding of reality, like we all show up on Friday night because we believe Friday exists. Friday doesn't exist, it's a shared mm -hmm. convention that is structured, that is reproduced through the, you know, the schedule of Berkeley, you know, it's a, it's a shared convention, right? So the same kind, the same thing can be said about the American dream. It's a very basic theme around which, like individualism, around which American society is organized. And as a shared notion, it has been extremely powerful as an engine of American society throughout the 20th century. It has functioned as a hope machine. It has brought a lot of immigrants to this country. And it has been extremely effective in appealing to people's hearts and mind and uh, to orient action and define behavior. So it has provided American citizens a normative sense of direction to their answer, to their action. What was the goal? To build prosperity. 
It also tells us the standard by which we can determine who belongs. The answer is the successful. A notion of who deserves our trust. The answer is those who thrive. And a definition of which group should be stigmatized. And the answer is what? Who is stigmatized in American society? The poor. Yeah. Yeah, but not only, but if you think the goal is to succeed, the lazy and those who don't try are stigmatized. And then there's some groups, like the non-whites, who presume to be associated with these moral traits. So you have a very subtle shift from shared conception of who is morally worthy to certain groups that get associated with these moral stigma. So one of the big problems with the literature on inequality, I think, is everyone is obsessed with getting more people to be middle class to pursue the American dream. But there's this basic fact that you cannot make 100% of the population fit in the top 20%. And I think one of the results of the amazing hegemony of the American dream is that a lot of Americans think they are losers. Because they are told every day when they watch television, when they watch reality television, that we should all aspire to have the comfort level and the obsession with success and with achievement that is at the center of uh, American culture. And I think it's not working at all. I think it's a basically a bankrupt idea. Probably a number of you are children of immigrants and you've been spoon fed with the uh -huh. American dream since a very uh, early age. And everyone, immigrants in, and immigrants in this country are those who believe most in the American dream. So it's a powerful myth. It's something that has made a lot of people do a lot of things, but you will see why. I think it doesn't work very well, and we need to move away from defining people in terms of their socioeconomic success. Self-reliance is at the center of it, and self-reliance is what feeds the deep stigmatization of the poor, much more stigmatized in the US than they are in most advanced industrial societies. And it also extends to the stigmatization of racial minorities who are viewed as poor or perceive as claiming a larger size, a larger amount of the collective resources than they should. So, so the context is neoliberalism, which has spread you know, massively since 1980. So this is a LexisNexis search that shows the diffusion of the term neoliberalism uh, across uh, Europe and the US. Uh, since uh, 1978, and you see that it's partly intense in 2015-16, and equally strong in Europe as in the US, and that's very surprising. So in the book, uh, Social uh, Resilience, we uh, there's a first chapter written by Peter Evans, who taught here for a long time, and Joe Sewell, and they contrast, they talk about the four aspects of neoliberalism, political, administrative, economic, the part I'm most interested in has to do with the scripts of the self. The notion that we that diffuses about who's a worthy person. And that worthy person looks like this guy to the extent that the key values are you're supposed to be competitive. If you're not competitive, you're a loser. You're supposed to value material success and be very oriented toward it. You're supposed to search social status. If other people think you have social status, you're great. Self-reliance is crucial. You're not supposed to be a sponge. You're not supposed to depend on the state to get you know, welfare. You're supposed to stand on your end. You believe in meritocracy. And these values I've been diffusing like crazy for the last decades. We can see this partly in this figure, which you will not be able to read, but it's about um, the growing popularity of meritocracy, the level of faith in meritocracy across advanced industrial societies uh, or since 1910, and it has grown. You won't be able to read it, but basically that's what you find. You know, it has increased in all 23 countries, European and North American countries that are studied, except for Austria, Canada, and France. And uh, this is an indication of the, the spread, uh, which means that it also justifies uh, you know, the privileged position of the upper middle class because uh, if they are getting all that stuff in the context of growing inequality, it's because they work harder and they deserve it. The, the, the mechanisms through which privilege is passed on, let's say if you're a middle class American, it's possible that your parents move to a better neighborhood so you would have access to better schools. Well, that's called the passing on of privileges. 
So meritocracy is influenced by all the micro ways through which your parents and through which I've worked hard to get my kids in good schools, okay? Doesn't mean that you're not working hard and you're not smart, but there's a thousand processes through which privileges get to be passed on. And once in a while it's discussed, like when you have the scandal about you know uh, college admission that has been in the news for the last few months, but that's only the tip of the iceberg. You know, the whole system is organized around that. So, um, so I'm arguing that um, <clears throat> meritocracy reinforced the salience of the virtues associated with the American dream, with its focus on material success, etc. But I think we need more than one uh, measure of uh, of uh, success, and that's what we need to move toward. Uh, so we have uh, this faith in the American dream, which remains, remains extremely high, although we know that we are at the highest point of inequality from, you know, the beginning of the 20th century. So people continue to believe it. Why? Well, it has become a very soft concept. Everyone thinks, okay, it's a society where it's increasingly more difficult to succeed, but I will be able to do it. So they distinguish between their capacity to achieve it, whereas it, the society is perceived as being less able to deliver on this. And then people put everything under this, like having a good family means the American dream. So if you define it so broadly, it doesn't mean anything. And uh, you know, it becomes a fake. If you don't believe in the American in uh, the American dream, you're not an American, basically. So the the cost of not believing in it is very high. So at the same time, I think it's a very pernicious uh, belief to the extent that it, uh, it glorifies the lifestyle of the upper middle class, its competitiveness, its lifestyle, its resources, etc., and it's putting the onus on the majority of the population to measure up, while in fact most people cannot measure up. They simply cannot have the resources. And it also stigmatizes people who are less self-reliant, such as the poor and the working class, and it makes them, it makes, it also stigmatizes the groups that have been associated with the, you know, self-reliance, such as illegal immigrants who are constantly uh, vilified for using, you know, uh, medical care, going to the emergency room, etc. So you have a bifurcation that is growing in the context of neoliberalism with a growing recognition gap separating uh, you know, the upper middle class is the rest of the population, and we have in the current moment a great many social movements, Occupy, uh, Me Too, that are recognition claims, or, you know, DACA, or, you know, it's even, you know, Make America Great Again. It's a social movement from the right where people are making recognition claims. So this multiplication of movements are also an indication of how central, uh, it, it's a time where we really need to look more closely at uh, this recognition gap. But I think it's not working, certainly for the poor and the working class. We know about the opioid epidemic, we know about extreme poverty. It's also not working for the upper middle class. We're now facing a situation where uh, there's a major mental health crisis in the upper middle class. Uh, people are, um, we know that money and work are cited as the most, co most common reason for stress in, among U.S. adults. There's a huge increase in the mo number of upper middle class people who are facing important upper, uh, mental health uh, problems and it's associated with the uh, stress put on uh, success, which is extremely exhausting, but also insecurity, the increase in insecurity that has spread since uh, the 2008 uh, crisis that has turned a lot of parents into helicopter parents who are just spending all their time trying to pass on privileges to their children. So the situation is not rosy, and it's not rosy in your generation, not only at Berkeley, but everywhere else. There is this survey that is coming out from UCLA, the freshman survey, that shows the number of uh, Freshmen who are claiming to feel overwhelmed and depressed, well, it's grown uh, really steadily since um, this survey has been conducted. And I know that across all universities, the level of demand for mental health services is much higher. At the same time, you have this uh, lifestyle of the upper middle class that is offered to everyone as the model that one should follow to, su to succeed. 
Richard Butch, a sociologist, uh, has done a content analysis of over 400 primetime uh, sitcoms, 60 years of television, and he shows that over 90% of the characters are upper middle class people. So the working class never sees itself reflected on television. And when you see working class people like in The Simpson, the men are buffoons. They are you know, ignorant, immature, irresponsible. Their children are smart, but they themselves are not smart. So you find yourself with a working class that never sees itself reflected. So exposure to, ra uh, to rags to riches stories in entertainment television do the same thing. You have had the multiplication of reality TVs, you know, the Beverly Hill, you know, Wives of Beverly Hill, etc., which are all a celebration of the American dream. So there's a student of political communication, Eugene Kim, who shows that watching such program has a significant effect on believing in the American dream, particularly among Republicans and those who are politically optimistic, its impact is as strong as being children of immigrants, which is the group that believe, you know, believes most in the American dream. So this may suggest that much of inter entertainment television operates like a gigantic publicity machine for the distinctive scripts of the South that are associated with neoliberalism and which is are incarnating by the, incarnated by the upper middle class. So the situation with the working class, I'm not gonna go in details. Basically, they feel like losers. That's a book that I published in 2000 based on in-depth interviews with working class men in Paris and New York. And I find that uh, black and white working class men in New York are much more likely to feel that they are losers and they are glorifying more the life of the middle class than it is the case for their white country, the French counterparts, who are far more critical of uh, the professionals and managers. They think basically that professionals and managers are narcissistic, they're self-serving, they drop their friends when the good going gets tough. So there's a lot of moral virtues that they think are central to the life of the working class who are more, who have more integrity, they're not phonies. So whereas here, the working class is more under the domination of um, the values of the middle class, which translates in very different boundaries. So the question you were asking, I found in this book and I show how when you ask them, what kind of people are you superior to? Do you feel superior to in France? Uh, in, a, in the U.S., they will say I, superior, I feel superior to people who are sponges, people who don't pay taxes. I work hard. I make sure my kids uh, work hard. They stay out of trouble. They don't go to prison. I'm responsible. I pay my bills. Not unlike these people. And then very quickly, they draw boundaries toward the poor and they draw ethno racial boundaries. At the time I did the interviews, immigrants were still viewed as valued. You know, if they follow the American it's the dream, it's great. If they don't, if they are here to be sponges, they're trash. In France, they were far more accepting of the poor. They said, you know, there's mechanisms of structural inequality that makes them there's always going to be people who are going to be excluded from the labor market. It's not their fault. Now it's their turn. Next year I could be unemployed. So did not ask the poor to be self-sufficient the way that Americans did. But now I did an update of this analysis with her colleague, Nicolas Dubou, who studied changing attitudes toward the poor in France. And he shows, he has a book titled uh, the autonomy of welfare recipients that shows that they're now asked to demonstrate self-sufficiency, just like it was the case in the U.S. So you have convergence with greater polarization uh, toward the poor in France, but also much stronger boundaries toward Muslims. So the, in the previous book, you know, but mus boundaries toward blacks and the poor were much weaker in France than they were in the U.S., but boundaries toward Muslims were much stronger, and now they are even stronger. And their youth because there's a lot of unemployed youth in France are now very salient, as are the Romas, which they were not 20 years ago. So you have similar diffusion with uh, you know, transformation of ethno-racial and class boundaries in, um, across Europe as well. So it's a moment of hardening of class boundaries. That's one of the big problems with, no, with neoliberalism. So these figures are about, uh, you know, it's a feeling thermometer, how attitudes toward uh, various minority groups have become more uh, rigid over the last uh, decades, and you can see here how there's growing, uh, you know, boundaries toward African Americans, toward Chicanos and Hispanics, which of course uh, Trump is uh, feeding toward illegal immigrants. And here you don't see it among lesbian toward lesbian and uh, gays, but we know how much 
uh, Trump has been passing various executive orders that are marginalizing these groups. So that's one more reason why we need to really think about how to address the situation. It stinks. It's a very bad moment in American society. And I think it's partly a problem. And I happen to have three young adults in my family. So for the last, I have twins who are 18, who just started college. I spent a lot of the last few years with a lot of young people in my living room, talking with them about, and of course, I, I train a lot of graduate students and I teach undergrads. So I've become concerned about if the American dream is not working anymore. People are still believing in it, but it's not working. We know that the number of people who can actually achieve it is declining very rapidly. So we're selling people a bill of good. So we need to think about how to re-engineer our society at the cultural level so that people have other things to believe in. So how are we gonna figure out how to do this? I think one possibility is to look at what your generation is doing and thinking. So let's look at what the millennials and the Gen Z are appreciating, okay? So what are the values of this group? And what, where else do you find feelings of words? So I'm pushing for the multiplicity of criteria by which we assess worth. If we have one criteria, which is make money, everyone who doesn't make money is screwed. If we have multiple criteria, we need to systematically engineer and diffuse and figure out how new criteria of worth are emerging, who produces them, and how to diffuse them more broadly. So that's a kind of project of engineering, and of course I'm not gonna do this by myself. But I hope that we can generate, not only me, but more sociologists too, a general conversation about this. So how can it be done? And that can be done in part by understanding better, that's point number four, how does the public sphere work? Who are the people who are engineering these repertoires? Okay, where do you think we might look for that? Any idea? What do you watch? Where do you find your ideas? Whether it be like TV or it could be social media. Exactly, exactly. So we know the literature on Gen Zs. What do they, millennials, what do they like? What are the values that are central? These are really bad marketing studies, but they all show authenticity, inclusion, and sustainability are absolutely crucial. So we can look at what are the programs, the series, the Netflix, the Amazon, that are watched by your generation, transparent. Orange is the New Black, Girls, Euphoria. I mean, these are all shows that depict your generation. Your generation is watching it in part to get alternative frameworks of, you know, scripts of how to lead your life that doesn't look like Leave it to Beaver, right? And then if you have major shows, the shows that are most popular in your generation, that as, you know, trans people, well, it really transformed the vision of what reality is, you know? Or you watch Euphoria, and the main character is a, you know, a multiracial girl who's having a lot of problem. Well, people will see themselves reflected in this. So I think we can look at them. But more systematically, we can also see how uh, representation of reality are engineered. So I'm going to give you examples of how this, and then we can look at how the stigmatization happen. I'm talking too long. I'm just going to talk briefly about what these solutions are. And then we can, I can sit and we can talk. So here I just talked about where these narratives of hope are, are emerging. Well, think about the coverage of Greta Thunberg over the last two weeks. You heard declaration, we don't want hope. We want you to realize that you're destroying our future. So you have the doomers, this huge movement of young people who don't want to have children because they think their generation is totally screwed. So one, one idea is, you know, are doomers, are they gonna be creating progress or are they gonna do like the Gilets Jaunes in France and just destroy everything? You know, that's an example of the depth of desperation that this generation is facing. But I think that if they are finding in following, for instance, influencers who authenticity for them is extremely important, you know, I mean, in my living room full of young adults, the question of how people label their, their own sexuality, and then one week they're a they, and the next week they're she, and it's very difficult for the parents to follow all the changes and remember how to call people. But uh, the, a, the idea that how they define their own identity, and the fact that they want to relate to other human beings as human beings, as opposed to, you know, through their ascribed characteristic, is really an indication of the deep need 
to define happiness through the sincerity of your connections with people. So these are really signs indicating you know, the emergence of new ways. But this doesn't come from nowhere. One example is just last week, there's new Barbies that were launched that are transgender Barbies. And last year, I interviewed a woman named Jessica Wiener who was hired by Mattel to create a new Barbies that have nine different phenotypes. And the same woman uh, was in charge of helping Dove, uh, Soap Dove, to launch a uh, campaign for soap that was advertised with women in underwear by women of various sizes. So this is really an example of how representations of a more inclusive society get to be put on billboards uh, in Times Square and reflect to people the idea that diversity is a central value and that all kinds of people are desirable, not only skinny women that don't look like anyone you know. So there's literally, uh, these are agents of change. So a lot of what the project is doing, and that's what I'm doing now, is doing a lot of interviews with millennials, with these agents of change, and also with, you know, for, with, with working class people who are embracing the American dream to try to understand how else to be defined, who is worthy. So one of the things that the working class people do is they turn toward what I call ordinary cosmopolitanism. Or, 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 which is to say, and this is based on the book The Dignity of Working Man, I did a lot of interviews with North African immigrants living in Paris, people who were not college educated. They, you know, their job was to clean phone booths when phone booths existed, or you know, repair uh, roofs. And I would ask them, what makes people equal? You know, and they would say, well, we all spend nine months in our mother's womb. We all have ten fingers. We're all children of God. We're all equally, they didn't say those words, but that's what they meant. We're all equally insignificant at the cosmological level. We're all gonna die. We're all like speck of dust in the universe. So they pointed to really concrete pieces of evidence that our destiny as human being is equally ridiculous, whether you come from a rich family or not. So, but what's interesting is they didn't read Rousseau, you know, they didn't read Locke. They don't know about liberal theories and it's, pro you know, the basic, notion that you learn in college about why human beings are equal. It's really based on everyday experience of, you know, we all have to go to the baker in the morning to buy our bread. They live in Paris, so we didn't have to buy your bread every morning. But um, the point is they point to very concrete pieces of evidence. So that's a form of everyday cosmopolitanism that is a way to establish multiple criteria of value. Um, another study I did that gives us indications of how to promote a, a more uh, plurality of criteria of worth is the study of destigmatization, where we looked at three groups. You know, I was at Stanford in '83 when the AIDS crisis started. People were so scared of AIDS, like the idea that you could have AIDS by going to the bathroom, you know. And now this is a group that has been totally destigmatized. So one of my students, two of my students that I actually, one of them is here at Berkeley, um, we did an analysis of the process by which HIV AIDS became destigmatized, and we compared it with another book titled What's Wrong with Fat, which is a book about the fact that destigmatizing fatness has become impossible. You know, gay people, of, you know, the ideal typical gay man is a criminal class person. The ideal typical fat person is a lower class woman. So one group destigmatized extremely rapidly and successfully, and the other one cannot be destigmatized. So we have a kind of path analysis of why was one group successful, the other not? Well, the answer is how knowledge workers, people who have you know PhDs and masters in, in the social sciences or medical or law, I've all been involved in producing the knowledge and diffusing new frames about what these groups are about. And they did that, they were successful because in part they worked in close association with social movements, the people who are at the gay pride parade, et cetera. Constant you know, movement to try to transform the meaning associated with these groups. So that's also part of the answer. And then I just talked about my working class guys in uh, North Africa. So I think another thing that needs to be done is to look much more carefully at how the production of the public sphere is now changing with this world of social influencers. And uh, you know, really we need to think about where are the representations of the world coming from? 30 years ago, you had you know, religious leaders, politicians, 
professionals who were intellectuals who were really central to diffusing the shared categories through which we perceive reality, but now it's really being challenged with the popularity of social influencers. So I think we really need to tackle this question of how the production of shared representation of reality is happening. I'll, I'll give you one last example. I'm Canadian. As I was growing up, the, the, the nationalist movement in Quebec was at its peak. And French Canadians claimed to be one of the two founding nations of Canada. Forget the fact that they were First Nation people first. But you know, there was a real uh, concern among French Canadians to have English Canadians recognize that we were one of the two founding nations. And the, you know, this, the province of Quebec came very close to separating. And Pierre Elliott Trudeau, who was then prime minister, pushed the idea that we were a multicultural nation as a way to marginalize the, the, the separatist movement. And he told, you know, the new doxa about this country was, you know, the Ukrainian immigrants from southern Saskatchewan are as important in our national tradition as French Canadians. Of course, the French Canadians were really pissed. But today, when you survey Canadians about their national identity, and they will say the main thing that differentiates us from Americans is the fact that we're multinational nations. So it really transformed uh, the shared identity of what being Canadian means. And it's an example where you have a plurality of criteria of definition of the community that gets institutionalized that is far more inclusive. So you have a huge literature on the engineering of collective identity that we can draw on to understand better how to create in our society a system of defining worth that is more plurarchic. So I guess my message to you today is what I would like us to do is think much more systematically about how stigma works, how groups can claim identity. I wrote a book on peer review titled How Professors Think. One thing that was extremely clear from this book is if you rank proposals instead of rate proposals, ranking means there's only one set of winners. It's like you know when your professors are grading on a curve. That stinks because it means some win, some lose. Whereas if you rate, many people can have A's. So it's the same idea. If you have a plurality of criteria, different disciplines can shine. It's like in one system, you have economics at the top of the social sciences and anthropology at the bottom. It's like you know a very Darwinist approach to knowledge production. Whereas if you think about plurality, all the disciplines shine under different lights because we all study different aspects of reality. And we're complementary. And I think it's much better for the world of the social sciences to think about it that way. And I think similarly, if we think about the, she, the, the cultural scripts through which we evaluate our value as human beings, we need to think about it in a plurarchic fashion. And it's very important to me, this is very much part of thinking about resilience in a more sociological fashion. Your generation is fed with grit and, you know, the Superman who are able to pull themselves, uh, and the, all the solutions that are presented to you are nudge solutions. You know, you have to do yoga, you have to do meditation. It's all individualist solutions that are not addressing the sources of the problem. So what I hope to do with this analysis is to tell you a lot of the problem, it's not only about the economy, it's really about the cultural structures through which we define our worth as human beings, and these structures can be acted upon. The American dream, if we're explicitly critical of it, people will come to realize how it's screwing us up. And that we need to think much more explicitly about uh, how people define their values and how your generation are in fact pushing definitions of values that are far more pluralistic. So my message in some ways is a very optimistic message because I think the conditions that have led us to have Trump in power is, you know, there's a lot of these conditions that are uh, cultural conditions. How come, how do we come to admire, how does 40% of the American population come to admire a man like him? Well, under this are scripts of work that we really need to think about. And, um, you know, hope is, the world is cyclical, social change always happens, we're at a low point. I'm sure that, you know, you know, when I started this project, I asked all my uh, colleagues at, at Harvard, what's the next thing? And no one had hope. That's partly what led me to want to do this book, you know, the, my brilliant colleagues. No one had hope. And we know that it comes back, and hope is part of the human condition. 
what is a social phenomenon? So we need to understand it better to understand how to spread it and how to make it a project. And I think it's a project of Black Lives Matter and DACA and Me Too. <coughs> because these projects have in common that they are recognition claims movement. They are movements of people you know, claiming their worth as human beings. So I think we can do this. <coughs> Thank you. You've spoken about how, as compared to 20 years ago, more people today attribute poverty to the efficacy of one's self-reliance. What, if any, are the changes in the larger culture surrounding prosperity that could be responsible for the shift in thinking? You mean the great, the greater stigmatization of the poor that yes. we see today? Well, um, I think, well, one key moment is the 96 welfare to work reform that Bill Clinton passed that was all premised on the idea that the poor who were benefiting from welfare supports were lazy and that uh, they were very happy to take advantage of the system and that you know the majority of the taxpayers didn't want this anymore. So the system was reformed to require uh, low-income people to work in order to be supported. So you have laws like this that are not, uh, you know, that are means tested. In other, many other countries, access to, to welfare support is not means tested. It's a universal benefit. In Canada, independently of whether you make a lot of money or not, there's a child support that is available to everyone, uh, which means that uh, using those resources is not stigmatized. So even the way that distribution of resources is designed can be more or less stigmatizing or viewed as a human, a basic human rights. So that's one of the big differences, I would say. You could trace the policies that have been adopted over time in the U.S. to, to and fewer, fewer of them are in place. You know, food stamps that you know the, the, all the resources on which the poor can draw to support their family have declined drastically. And that's a strong, huge contrast with the situation that you see in France and Sweden and Canada. So there are different models of doing this. And it's, it's very obvious when you look at attitudes toward the poor. And the poor in the US get blamed for their situation. You touched on Pierre Trudeau and his rhetoric around Canada being a multi-national um, country. Um, and the American dream is often associated with the immigration of people from a, a variety of different backgrounds, um, not limit, limit, including but not limited to ethnicity, religion, socioeconomic status, and so forth. Uh, how would you balance your belief of the American dream being a myth, uh, myth uh, with some of its perceived um, positive externalities? Well, in my case, I'm an immigrant. I came here in 83 from Canada. And I had done my graduate work in France, and I knew that in France it would be very difficult for me to, to get a job as a social scientist because, first, it's a very colonial country that does not even think of itself as colonial. It was way behind the UK, for instance, in assuming its post-colonial uh, status. So I knew I would never get a job there. And then uh, I came here. Uh, one of the reasons I did it is that I knew that I could send papers to the American Journal of Sociology and get published. I felt it was a market, so it was extremely freeing. And so at some level, I really believed in the American dream. But I also think that with it comes extreme individualism, which means that it's much har harder for people to think that they need a community to succeed. You know, like we all need a network to succeed. So the level of social solidarity has been eroded. Uh, you know, you have books like uh, Robert Putnam, Bowling Alone. I mean, tons of books that demonstrate that the American society has veered toward a greater individualism. With you know, I mentioned the opioid epidemic. We know that the working class men who used to belong to the Knights of Columbus and go to church, etc., they don't marry anymore. 
you know, they don't want to marry because they think they cannot perform the role of the provider. So you have a literal destruction of what the traditional lifestyle of the working class used to be in the U.S. So I think that the, the situation is like a composite of trends that are very uh, contradictory. Uh, it's still a country where immigration is feeding this country, just like it is feeding Canada. So the fact that you have some, like many of you, you know, parents who leave their country who come here who believe that affordable open mobility is possible. So that's a fact of life. But at the same time, you have all these mechanisms that I talked about earlier hoarding privileges, passing on of opportunities that are mechanisms that are really contradicting this shared rep representation we have of American society. That's a meritocratic society. So these trends are really at odds with each other. Um, and I believe that, you know, we know that the frequency of contact across social classes has declined drastically. You know, the number of working class, pe upper middle class people who know what the working class of the work, uh, the life of the working class is like, has diminished drastically. So all this contributes to legitimizing in their head all the privilege that they have and that they can pass on to their children. So, you know, there are books that have been written like American Apartheid uh, by Massey and Danton, that which is about, you know, the fact that fewer and fewer white people have contacts with people of color. So one of our graduate students, uh, his dissertation is on meritocracy, and it shows that one of the best predictor of uh, having a strong faith in meritocracy is having uh, roommates, if you're white, that are also white. So having roommates in college that are not of your same ethno-racial group makes a huge difference in people being able to understand uh, the ways in which privilege is passed on, you know, the just uh, daily coexistence with people who come from different groups. Incidentally, I have a son who is now at Harvard. He's a freshman, so the first day, he's, he, there are five boys together in a suite, and they all, he, he calls me and he says, they all look like Captain America, you know, tall, white. My daughter who came here helps me moving him move him in and she comes out of the bedroom and she's living and she says, people like that, they don't come to Berkeley. This is the reproduction of inequality. She was living because they had put all these guys together, you know? And uh, the incarnation of the waspish, you know, Ivy League university, she could really see it. So going back to my student who, who studies, you know, he can really show that having exposure in daily life to people who are not like you makes a huge difference in terms of challenging the beliefs that people have about, uh, you know, the meritocracy and, and inequality, you know, who gets what. Unfortunately, for the sake of time, that was my yeah. last question. Oh, okay. So we will now be uh, opening uh, up the audience portion, the audience question portion. If you have any questions, please raise your hand and I will call it on you. Please remember to keep your questions brief and very concise. Yeah. Uh, thanks for coming. You talked quite a bit about uh, the frustration with the capitalistic system and how a lot of youngsters in America are trying to go through destigmatization de through, say, for example, euphoria, which you know, emphasizes inclusion and transparency. But at the same time, if we look at other parts of the world, for example, in Hong Kong, where you have a lot of lower class youngsters going to the streets using relatively more violent methods and perhaps buying into this you know, neoliberal script by um, demanding better social or material mobility. So how do you see the difference in like across countries of the world where youngsters decide how to define, you know, what they should destigmatize or not, and whether or not this violence towards inclusion is just like a timeline and evolution, or is just a systematic difference between the countries? That's a great question. I should have clarified, I don't think that keeping people in misery is a solution. It's more that most social scientists who work on inequality are just focused on the redistribution of resources. And I would not advocate that, you know, working class people don't need resources. You know, but it's not only my argument is more that we think so much about resources that we forget about the cultural part of the equation and I wanted to share to shed light on this. But of course, you know, you have Maslow's theory. You need to reach a cer certain level of uh, material well-being to be able to think about uh, other aspects. But there are books that are written 
about uh, you know the fact that even people who live in misery can have a great sense of dignity and the richness of their family relationship. It's not like you have to be rich to be uh, happy. And, but at the same time, you have social movements such as Hong Kong that is also a pro-democracy movement. It's not only about claiming mobility, right? It's also a, a rejection of what uh, China is trying to do uh, in Hong Kong, which is very repulsive, especially given the promises that were made when Hong Kong uh, you know, joined China after the end of the British. Uh, so, Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. I think we have time for one more audience question. Can I go? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, you talked a bit about engineering um, social values and social mm -hmm. sort of norms. And I'm wondering if you think that should come from a bottom up or a top down mm -hmm. perspective. Because it almost seems, from the bottom up side, it seems almost um, impossible to actually have a, social, a unified social narrative developed by so many people. Whereas in the top down side, I think sort of in the antithesis of a neoliberal state, sort of in the more Keynesian and social state, um, mm -hmm. socialist state, um, I feel like there is irony in the sense that you are um, trying to push for a message of individuality and sort of embracing diversity, whereas in that process, you are actually reinforcing higher. Mm -hmm. I understand. Yeah. And I must say, as I was starting to do this, I don't like the idea of the Harvard professor that will, you know, right. say, okay, now let's do this. While in fact, we know that it comes from social movements, like if you think Black Lives Matter, but there's a study of who were the leaders of Black Lives Matter. Most of them were LBGTQ youth from liberal arts colleges, women. So they were highly educated as compared to the average population, and they played a very crucial role in articulating. And then that led, you know, you have a back and forth between the frame offered by the leaders and the movements that follow. So the social change comes from mobilizing a lot of people. Uh, I remember going to China to give a talk in Wuhan, and there were part everywhere in the airport books by my colleague Michael uh, Sandel what money can buy, and then I went to give a talk at one of these uh, foreign language high school in China where so many of the Chinese people who end up studying here went, and there was a conversation, and the, right away the kids that, who were there asked me questions about individualism and consumption. That's an example where that book by Michael Sandel was directly influencing what those kids who were likely to become the next elite of China we're consuming. So it's an example of a back and forth. You know, you have to think about who produces the ideas, how the ideas are diffused, which is why now I'm writing a book that will be auctioned in two weeks and that will be diffused far more broadly than all the other books I've written in the past, precisely because I want this book to be, to be uh, read very broadly so that people in your generation you know, like, there's very few books on neoliberalism that have been diffused broadly. You know, people just think this is, you know, too abstract for, it's not like everyone's going to read it, but I think the goal with books like this is to stimulate a conversation so that at least the idea that the American dream is a prison uh, is put out there. I don't think there's a lot of people who are saying this, and I think it's important to think about that. Well, that's all the time we have. Thank you for answering all of our questions. I'd now like to uh, welcome back our president, Tanya Mahadwar, back up for some closing remarks. Let's give a round of applause for Oma Char. Thank you all so much for taking the time out of your nights to come to this evening's edition of the Berkeley Forum. Um, and if any of you would like to ask Professor Lamont some questions, you're more than welcome to, but she does have a plane to catch, so she can maybe stick around for 10 more minutes? Not really, because my plane is at 9, okay. and there's a lot of traffic, but you have my, uh, I need to get to yeah. San Francisco Airport in the next 45 minutes, but you have my email here, and you know, really the reason I accepted to give this talk is because you are Berkeley undergrads, and you are the people I want to talk to. So I'm not because you're at Berkeley, but because you're <laughs> undergrads. So I really would like to hear from you. If you have general reaction to my talk, if you think that there's some things that I'm totally overlooking and you think the talk is accept, 
and especially this year I'm on sabbatical, so I really want to write my book, but I accepted because I was going to talk about the grads. So please do write to me if you have any reactions, okay? Thank you. I was about to say that at all of our events, we always um, honor our speaker with a custom Ooh, poster. Thank you. There you go. And I don't know who made that poster, but as uh, uh, you were showing it to me, I was really, you know, this is such a great design, you know. So I please congratulate the person who made it because <laughs> I'm very impressed. <laughs> and we'll be having um, next Tuesday. We'll be hosting Karen Diver at the Berkeley Forum. She's the White House Special Assistant um, on Native American Affairs to President Obama, and that'll be in Evans 81. And in addition, we really value your feedback. So if you could all take the time to fill out tinyurl.com/slash/BerkeleyForumFeedback. That would be really helpful for us as we try to improve our events this semester. Have a great evening. <laughs>